Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of CXO in Focus with your host Aksa Tariq. Today we have with us Mr. Justin Ho, co-founder and co-CEO of Utiba, an initiative providing a cashless environment to many countries. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Web Studio TV. Thank you very much. Um, so Utiba was formed in uh, 2001, mm -hmm. uh, so we've been uh, around for a substantial amount of time, um, focused primarily on uh, mobile payments mm -hmm. and mobile commerce. Um, we, we started the company uh, very much with a view to um, how the mobile phone is going to impact people's lives and very much with a view to making a difference at uh, the bottom of the pyramid mm -hmm. uh, to help people um, uh, alleviate poverty, to help people to uh, get out of uh, the, um, circumstances uh, where they can participate in the, in the, in the uh, um, commerce sector more efficiently, mm -hmm. um, get access to banking services and financial inclusion. Um, for me, that's been a very important personal journey. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate as a child to have uh, parents that uh, exposed me uh, at a very early age to um, poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, at the age of three, I went to Calcutta. Um, and uh, saw poverty uh, very, very starkly, uh, very closely, um, and, and very real, um, and uh, continued to see that uh, around around the, the world wherever I travel. Um, so I think it's it's something that that we do um, that's in our DNA mm -hmm. is to is to do this to make a difference in the world, uh, to help people at the at the bottom of the pyramid. Now when we started the first ecosystem of mobile payments, one of the first in the world, in the Philippines, one of the key initiatives that uh, uh, was brought to bear was the ability to be able to remit money directly to a mobile wallet. And on top of that, the ability to pay a bill from overseas at a low cost directly uh, to the, uh, the billing party. So for me it's about, uh, for, for Utiba and for me it's about making a difference, uh, providing people access to financial services, mm -hmm. uh, financial inclusion, um, and uh, really bringing the bottom of the pyramid uh, to get access to um, services that uh, you and I take for granted. Talking about how it launched in uh, Philippines, yeah. you guys have made an impact in uh, 20 countries now. Actually, it's over uh, over 30 countries now, mm -hmm. uh, with over uh, 70 implementations around the world. All right. um, so we have a, a, a far-flung footprint. Uh, we started off in Asia, uh, in the Philippines, as you mentioned. Uh, now we're present in Africa. We're present in uh, uh, some nice uh, remote places like uh, 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 DRC, Democratic Republic of, of uh, Congo, uh, Madagascar. Uh, Mauritius, uh, Bolivia, uh, Guatemala, all of these uh, exotic places, but all of them have one thing in common mm -hmm. and that is that they have a very high penetration of mobile phones mm -hmm. and they have a very high uh, percentage of the population which is underbanked and that phenomenon of course is present, is present in uh, Pakistan as well. All right, so uh, prior to launching Utiba, you had also founded eBusiness Asia. Yeah. So how did you make this shift from manufacturing business to...? So eBusiness Asia was a, an auction portal in .com 1.0 mm -hmm. uh, that I started, and it was, it was my uh, first failure. Uh, and so that, that one didn't go too well. Um, and that, that was originally a site designed to aggregate uh, small artisanal craftspeople. Uh, so people have skills in uh, making um, art or uh, various goods um, of an artisanal nature and trying to aggregate them and give them access to uh, overseas markets. Um, but unfortunately my timing was not great and uh, that one was not successful. That, that one didn't work out, but it was a great lesson. <laughs> All right. So a common name in the case of uh, virtual payments has been PayPal, but it hasn't been able to, um, you know, uh, due to like a State Bank of Pakistan not allowing them yeah. to come in. So how do you think that you can deal with uh, government authorities maybe, or how do you like get into these countries and, you know, create that massive impact? In fact, um, um, uh, I had the, the pleasure to meet with uh, the governor of the State Bank yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
and I think he's done a marvelous job in terms of architecting the right policy for this country. Um, you have in different countries uh, different strategies as to the way that uh, financial inclusion or branchless banking uh, should be implemented, uh, but I applaud him for the way that he has um, uh, architected his policy. Uh, one of the key uh, strategies that needs to be uh, taken into account is to create an open payment system. And whether it be a bank-led or telecom-led, to me does, doesn't really matter per se, but what we really want is to create an open system. So if I can give you an analogy, I'm not sure if you remember, uh, but uh, back in the early days, uh, you used not to be able to send an SMS to somebody who was on another network. Prior to opening up uh, SMS to be interconnected uh, between everybody, it meant that if I was, for, for example, on MobiLink, I could only send messages to that, to, to that uh, uh, another customer who was on that net network. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Now, after some time, they opened up the system so that you could send it from anywhere to anywhere, and indeed you could send it globally. And what that meant was that you had an explosion because uh, the, the power of transactions and messaging is uh, something called Metcalfe's Law, mm -hmm. whereas the utility of the network is equal to the, uh, the square of the number of the user, users. So, SMS is a clear example of what an open architecture has done, and we need that in payments. Um, so uh, the state bank is looking at an open architecture. Uh, it's a bank-led model, uh, but that what they want to do is to achieve interoperability, mm -hmm. and so that anybody can send money to anybody, regardless of which bank they uh, belong to. Right. So have you faced any challenges in the, fifth, uh, in the above over 30 countries that you've uh, went to? Uh, challenges? Yeah. Uh, many challenges. Uh, I've had uh, my sales person in Sri Lanka, uh, pre uh, he was at the airport when they started dropping bombs. Uh, I've had um, uh, many of my professional services people in countries in Africa get caught in, in uh, civil, civil wars or riots. Uh, so uh, working in these countries is challenging uh, by nature. Uh, almost by definition, where we work, you can expect some sort of civil unrest. Um, and uh, so, so that is very challenging in terms of building a, a, an organization and getting that to roll out. Uh, but I think um, that the, the challenges have been come through in ways. Um, Utiba's uh, very proud of its heritage and innovation and building one of the first uh, sites uh, for mobile payments in the world, and that was back in 2004. And since then, uh, we've gone through a number of waves. So the first issue was convincing regulators uh, in each country that this is something that they needed to do. Uh, so that we spent probably the first three to four years uh, going through that process. So the discussion in the early part was all about regulation. And because the telecoms were involved and the banks were involved and they were uh, regulated by different authorities, uh, there was a, a lot of issues around that and you still see that in some certain countries where the regulators are moving at a, a much slower pace than other countries. Um, so that was a big challenge that we had to, had to overcome. Uh, and then I think the other big challenge has been uh, about helping the people who are running these services to make them as successful as possible. And here is where UTIBA brings its strength uh, to, to making that successful because Implementing a mobile payment system is about bringing essentially three parties together, uh, a, a carrier, mm -hmm. uh, a bank, and a merchant. A merchant being an agent, mm -hmm. or a, a, a physical uh, merchant selling goods and services, or a virtual merchant for that matter. So bringing those people together is uh, challenging. Uh, and, and bringing a business model together that makes sense for all of those parties is challenging as well. Um, so building that ecosystem is something that we have a long heritage and experience and what we've done out of that experience is, is build our technology in a way that it helps to uh, accelerate uh, the, uh, the, the building of that ecosystem. Alright, so is Utiba planning to expanding in Pakistan or...? Ab absolutely. Um, Pakistan is a, a very important market for us. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, I mean, Pakistan has uh, some, some very interesting statistics. I think there's a, only about 23 million people in Pakistan today who have bank accounts. Uh, there's about uh, 89 million people who are unbanked. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, there's a dire need to uh, create financial inclusion, uh, to support uh, programs like the BISP program, uh, and to really take uh, uh, banking and payment services into the rural areas. All right. Uh, focusing on uh, you, you know, you mentioned a few statistics on uh, banking yeah. and uh, mobile usage mm -hmm. in Pakistan. How fertile do you see this industry, and how uh, well do you think the system could work locally? Um, the opportunities are, are really boundless. Um, the the opportunity is really about understanding the, the target market that you're going after. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can give you an analogy uh, here, uh, which is that today, most banks are focused on the top tier of the, of, of the pyramid. So if you look at a pyramid, most banks are at the top 20, 10% uh, in a country, and that's where they focus. And historically, that's how they understand their business. Now, um, a good uh, historical lesson to look at is how other companies have fared when you look at a market that was originally very focused at the top but has now become widely available. Um, and for me, uh, I think the airline business is a, is a great model to look at. If you look at the airline business today, it has really fallen in, into two categories. Um, in deregulated markets, you have premium airlines mm -hmm. and you have budget airlines. Anyone in between is going bankrupt. So the premium airlines like Emirates, uh, like Singapore Airlines, uh, have full service, full service uh, airlines. They cater uh, to, a, to a high end client. Uh, they are all about providing um, service uh, differentiation. Uh, but what comes with that is a higher cost base. And therefore, the fares have to be higher to, in order to make that airline profitable. Mm -hmm. Now you contrast that to a budget airline. A budget airline has um, very uh, uh, much lower levels of service. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have the frequency of flights. Uh, it only has one class of aircraft uh, and it doesn't uh, have a business class. But what it does do is it strips out cost wherever it can. Uh, an example is uh, one of the uh, uh, Ryanair in um, in, in uh, Europe is looking at uh, putting standing seats in their aeroplanes uh, so mm -hmm. that they can comp uh, add more uh, seats onto the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. So for a budget airline, it's about stripping cost out of their business. And if they strip cost out of their business, they can offer a service that's affordable mm -hmm. to people on a lower income. Mm -hmm. So for me, the banking industry, the financial services industry, is about understanding that on one side I will have a premium bank, but on the other side I need a budget bank. And that budget bank has to be tailored in terms of the way its entire cost structure is built using technology, mm -hmm. using branches banking, getting rid of bricks and mortar, uh, building an agent network, a, a vast agent network uh, that gives you wide and deep distribution into the rural uh, heartland um, and, and thereby being able to layer services and products that target those particular markets. Right. Uh, earlier on you talked about different initiatives that have been trying to do something similar, like for example we have Easy Pesa mm -hmm. on UBL only doing something similar, trying to create that financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think uh, Utiba will face a direct competition or do you uh, see other uh, maybe global companies or global initiatives as competitors? Um, I, I think uh, Utiba d does face competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, you know U UBL and, and the examples that you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, we would uh, we are working as technology partners to other banks, so we don't directly try and compete with with banks. We see ourselves as a uh, technology provider and also helping uh, the banks to be able to build out their their network. Um, so uh, for, for us it's about uh, innovation to, to beat, beat off our competition. Uh, we've innovated ever since uh, we started our business. 
as I gave you an example, 2004, the first case of mobile payments in the world. 2007, we did the first international remittance uh, from a wallet to a wallet using SMS. Uh, and we continue to innovate in different areas. Uh, for us, the next area of innovation is open loop payments. Mm -hmm. So open loop payments uh, could be uh, a strategy that, that is being rolled out in Pakistan, where you have interconnectivity between the different systems. Or in other parts of the world, uh, we have an alliance with MasterCard, uh, where we are creating open loop payments and joining uh, banking instruments such as prepaid cards, debit cards, credit cards to a wallet, uh, so that you'll be able to use your wallet on the internet, for example. So you can pay uh, for goods and services on the internet and create an open infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Focusing on Utiba's future plans, yeah. you have a two-year plan, a five-year plan of expansion or uh, developing new project, uh, projects? Um, we continue to, to roll out uh, across different geographic areas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, we're very strong now in, in Latin America. Uh, we're rolling out in Africa. Uh, and we have a very strong presence in, in, in Asia. Uh, some newer markets for us are, are, are Eastern Europe and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it's a, it, it's a geographic expansion. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, then for us, it's, it's all about innovation and taking these services to the next level. Um, so we can see many, many different services coming on board. If you look at most of the people who have uh, copied the models that have been done in the Philippines. They take the fairly standard services, mm -hmm. which are person-to-person -person transfers, domestic remittance, bill payments. Mm -hmm. um, going forward uh, in, in markets like this, uh, there's opportunities to innovate. For example, uh, in Pakistan you have this phenomenon of uh, committees mm -hmm. where people join uh, to create what I would call a, a self-organized microfinance uh, uh, capability. So that's a, a kind of innovation uh, that we're looking at to see how we can bring that into the, the mobile commerce space. All right. Uh, before we close the show, I'd just like to say something to our audiences. Um, uh, th thanks for watching and um, uh, su supporting uh, this program. Um, I think uh, if I could get a message across, uh, across to uh, the audience, it would be that uh, um, mobile payments is, is critical uh, to be provided at the bottom of the pyramid. It is a, a social imperative. It's a social obligation. Uh, if any of you are watching, that means you have an internet connection. Uh, you probably have uh, some sort of a bank account. Uh, you probably have tools that you take for granted, credit cards, payments, et cetera, et cetera. 80% of, of the population in this country doesn't have access to that, those kind of tools that you take for granted. Um, so be open to these new services. Uh, if you're in the, in the business, invest in looking into these new business models uh, and uh, uh, be, be aware that this is something that we need to do uh, as part of a social obligation to uh, provide financial inclusion for everybody. All right, before we close the show, I'd just like to highlight the role of technology that this particular initiative has made and created a global impact. This is your host, Aksa Tarek, signing out from CXO and Focus. Uh, stay tuned with us next week with another episode.